Anyway, I'd like to echo what Sean was just saying. Originally, I had thought of this as a show and tell sequence. I would, I would show the slides and then Sean would tell about it. This way, it's a little bit more like tell and show. Um, Sean already showed one of our graphs of what happened on September 11th, and I'll be showing the same one again if they get this up there. Uh, this is our reachability graph for a certain percentage of the internet. What we do on each graph, first of all, is identify exactly what each of the line components is polling. This is a limited set because we were interested in what was going on in southern New York City, so that among what we call the world ISPs, we're polling just over 1,000 of them. We're looking at only one DNS server, which is the bottom line, 300-odd uh, web servers, and overall, uh, I can't even read it myself, uh, something over 1,000 uh, internet hosts routers, etc. Um, as many of you probably know, Matrix.net and uh, its predecessor, uh, Matrix Information Directory Services, known as MIDS, has been graphing and mapping for just over a decade. And as a result, we've got a gazillion bits uh, accessible for history of the net, and we've been doing uh, as much as we can in the days following September 11th to center on what was going on specifically in southern Manhattan and the world as a whole. Can I have the next one, please? Uh, just in case you're curious, we have what we refer to as beacons, our probes, uh, at nearly 100 points around the world. There's one in Australia, one in Singapore, one in Hong Kong, etc., working this way around. And what we do is we, and I'll use the word ping even though we don't only use ping, uh, over 60,000 sites every 15 minutes, 24-7. Uh, a typical beacon list contains just over 10,000 entries, so we have at least one that has over 20,000 entries in it, and we have none of those, well, 67,200 on Saturday sites uh, that we came from less than two different beacons so that every 15 minutes we get a tremendous amount of data. We employ ping, we employ HTTP, and we employ traceroute actively in all situations. We do not do any static type of analysis. And as the next graph gives us a different view of what happens. This is a longer term covering the 11th and the 12th. Uh, the spike towards the right-hand side is the initial impact spike. The one following it was the first uh, of the serial collapses of World Trade Center 7. And the third uh, piece was the actual uh, call it power failure uh, at, uh, uh, on uh, Broadway, uh, which we'll go to later. But you can see that as a result of the infinite amount of prediction that Len Kleinroth and Paul Barron and the Shapiro, John Davis, Roger Scantlebury wrote about all over 30 years ago. The packet switching network healed to a very, very great extent uh, following this tremendous trauma. Uh, can I go to the next one? Uh, this is a one-week perspective, and this is the kind of variability that Sean was talking about. That first impact was tremendous. We came back up to within 2% or so of the reachability. Reachability is whether or not can HTTP or Facebook can actually get to a given host, whatever it happens to be. By host here, I mean something that has an IP. It could be a router, it could be a private bank, it could be the outer edge of a firewall, it could be a host itself. Uh, as you can see, the consecutive failures, some of the power failures, some of the building collapse, 
some of them just other kinds of infrastructure problems have gone on tremendously. This only gives you the period to the 17th. Uh, in the following period, uh, it has continued, though so nowhere near as severely. One of these next things is this in more detail is what, the, what I will call the consecutive power failure did. September 11, 9 o'clock in the morning, is the first major dip in that uh, graph. And as, we, as time went on, we can see exactly where battery, fair, battery service started to fail after a couple of hours. They put in the diesel generator, and I can believe also that what Sean said is correct. Dust has contributed to the failure of the diesel generator. Uh, I think that actually, while it was noted that there was overheating in the generator, they attributed it to dust. I think it was actually maintenance. They just weren't changing those damn air filters frequently enough in the past. After all, do you maintain filters on them? generator that you haven't been using, except for you turn it on once every 30 days to see if it will still turn over. And the answer is you don't turn it over. So that it was overheating in the generator, but it wasn't necessarily compared to the dust. The dust was if you want an ancillary factor of that. Uh, can I go to the next one? This is a specific building, I believe, yes. This is what happened at 25 Broadway, and we happen to have a bunch of sites. Notice that we're now down to a much smaller number of possible posts that we're probing, but we had a number of places that were focused at or on 25 Broadway, so we could get a very, very good image. This is the going down, coming back up, and then eventually the collapse of the site. As we go on, uh, now in October, all those circuits have been replaced, though the building is still uh, less than wonderful. Uh, that's a wonderful answer, I But the thing is that over and over again, I saw, as we focused in on a given site, the sort of thing that Sean was talking about, that it wasn't a single blow, it wasn't the sever of some connection the way the the moron with the backhoe in northern Ohio a couple of years ago, the fire in uh, Naperville, Illinois at the uh, AT&T Center uh, a few years before that, just did an abrupt termination of service. But here, we have it coming in and out and going up and down. Now the next thing please. The one month perspective is very interesting. We were told that there had been, don't forget, Nimda is in here, uh, Code Red 2 is in here, uh, late August and September were not exactly the best months for the internet as a whole. So notice that the, uh, the wobble in the, um, in the ISPs in general and in the web in general is nowhere near what it was like on the various internet hosts. But you can see that we have this variation, that there's a great deal of giggle in terms of reachability internationally and nationally. So that one has to look at these events on a comparative basis rather than on an absolute basis. And I go to the next I, I get about 20 or 30 telephone calls a week from Pardon me now, morons in the media. It's not just that I do this for literative purposes. I think that people at MSNBC and ABC News and even uh, well known newspapers uh, in a large city that is a fact that the main name was uh, assigned somebody like, hey, go call up these guys and find out if they know anything. Uh, and one of the questions I got most recently was this the worst blow that the internet is at the supper. And that's a really tough question because, as all of you know, the internet went through a decade and it doubled in size every year. And it's now been almost a decade that it has gone uh, at a, grown at a factor of one and a half. 
So in September of this year, we had about 150, maybe 160 million posts worldwide on the net. A 12% drop in that is a larger number than the entire number of posts in 1994 when we had the most recent posts. So it's kind of somewhere between 10 and 12 million posts. Thus, it's very hard to know exactly what it means. Um, the moment the, the Northridge earthquake, uh, that incredible spike, was, if I can refer to it appropriately, a totally secondary effect. We would have lost all the hosts in Northridge proper and a few surrounding things except one very large ISP. Uh, again, this is the main name if I'm following Sean. Uh, uh, had a uh, very, very significant pop in the northern suburb of Los Angeles where some people who worked with hardware had forgotten to anchor the racks of routers to the concrete floor, and so they fell over when the shop hit. And you drop those things on the floor, from up to 78 inches high, for some reason they stopped working. That was that. It was really quite incredible. It took out a tremendous area of service as a totally unnecessary secondary effect. Uh, it took us about three weeks to figure out exactly what it happened. But uh, this was largely specific as the malevolence of the Can I have the next one? Um, that's a natural event. Here's another natural event. This was Hurricane Floyd. Uh, I couldn't locate an actual daily uh, chart, so this is, covers a, a longer period of time, but it's in 1999. The interesting thing is that that downward spike in reachability for the southeastern United States does not coincide with the time or the date of the actual strike of the hurricane on the southeast coast. It predates the try between 12, 8 to 12 hours. The reason that we figured out was that everybody warned by the National Service, Weather Service, etc., turned off their equipment and went and drove inland. And that it comes up uh, rather sharply because the minute there was the all clear, everybody drove back in, powered up their equipment, and boom, there they were again. Uh, but it's a very interesting example of two different natural events five years apart. Can I have the next one? This one, on the other hand, is malevolence at work. Uh, most of you probably remember last spring, COS attack, CNN.com, uh, Amazon.com, and a variety of other sites uh, were attacked uh, simultaneously by uh, a denial of service. And here, again, you can see what we were pulling a relatively large number because we were interested in a national effect rather than a local one. And it's quite interesting because it actually has a slight precursor. It's most visible uh, on the third line from the top, the one that's the internet, because of course a lot of these things attack uh, servers rather than necessarily the web host or something like that. Uh, can I have the next to the last one? This is this year's April Fool virus. And the interesting thing about it is that it had a very sudden and very sharp effect and a very, very quick recovery and then secondary effect. And it recurred uh, no time, never again uh, in this. The Nimda worm, which I forgot to bring, uh, has a very interesting thing in that the, uh, uh, the group that perpetrated it said that it had a zombie effect and that it would recur in a week. And in fact, uh, just over six days later, there was a secondary effect. And a week after that, a second, uh, I guess I have to call it tertiary effect. And since then, there has been 10 days later, one reoccurrence. But since that point, nothing at all. I don't know whether this means that the kitties just got bored with it or whether it died 
or whether suddenly people decided to install patches we all knew about earlier, but nobody ever bothered to put in on uh, Microsoft machines of various kinds. But at any rate, the April Fool virus and the DDoS attacks show a sharp difference in the way that they occur and recover from the sort of thing we saw both on September 11th, uh, which I consider a different kind of malevolent attack. But all of them, interestingly enough, show just how good the network is at routing around and recovery. And I think that's the most important thing. And I'm hoping that by being perhaps over hasty but a little bit brief, what I've done is gotten Sue back on schedule because it's just about 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, those slides didn't work originally. Are there questions for Peter? Peter, thank you so much for being. Oh, just just a, a real quick question. Yeah, uh, Peter, there, there seemed to be a, a disturbing trend line downward in terms of reachability for for so many of those slides. Yes, I wonder if. Um, things pick back up, right, and sort of return back to a stasis of... Yeah, actually by the 2nd of October, everything was back to where it was the day after Labor Day. So that would be, wait, I can't remember when Labor Day was this year, just give me a minute. The se it was on the 2nd. The 3rd of September and the 2nd of October are about as close to identical as you can tell. Uh, one of the interesting things which... Uh, Sean alluded to is that in hitting the Verizon top and uh, on West Street and 7 WTC, which was a major switching station, uh, or the bottom of it was, uh, two very, very large transatlantic connections went. One was an OC-128. The other one was smaller than that, but it was pretty damn big. Let's just put it that way. The incredible effect that that had on the transatlantic connections to Boston and to the Washington area was really quite something. Latency literally doubled to Boston from uh, uh, Telehouse uh, in London uh, within 40 minutes. And uh, latency over doubled uh, to the, uh, what was the UUNet pop, I guess I have to call it the Worldcom pop. Uh, in Virginia uh, from Amsterdam. So the rerouting on the part of all the European hosts, etc., worked just great, but none of those was designed to carry the incredible increase in traffic that it got. Uh, it's something that we just hadn't thought about. We hadn't thought of timeliness, so to speak, in terms of just getting the messages through. Packet, lo packet loss was really quite trivial after the first um, uh, effect, shock effect. Uh, it's just that everything slowed down dramatically. 